Welcome to the Love the Star podcast. I'm Bobby Belt, Dallas Cowboys insider for 105 through the fan at Dallas, your radio flagship home of the Dallas Cowboys. Joined as always by former Super Bowl winning NFL scout Brian Broadus. He is now the co host of the G Bag Nation, 2 to 7 p.m. Central, Monday through Friday on 105 through the fan in Dallas. And he is also the pre and post game co host on the Dallas Cowboys radio network. And we brought you guys a, an immediate reaction episode to the Patriots Cowboys game earlier this week. Uh, we've both gotten a chance now to look at the film a little bit, so we're going to give you some of the broader, uh, deeper takeaways from that game, uh, then look ahead a little bit to the San Francisco game, and then we'll do the mailbag. But uh, before we jump into any of that, Brian, how you doing? Uh, happy 49ers week. Yeah, how about that, man? This is a uh, this is an exciting week. It's also a very stressful week when you yes. start to deal with, uh, with teams that um, – the NFL, I should say, it's stressful every week. What am I saying? It doesn't matter who you're playing. But this particularly is a, a moment that, or a week where you're dealing with oh, with who I call a bully. I think San Francisco, the 49ers, I think they're they're very much uh, in the National Football League uh, hierarchy. They're the one team that has that ability to go anywhere, uh, home, road, doesn't matter. And they're going to be a physical – bunch that you have to deal with and you know the last couple of years Dallas has played them very well defensively been knocked out of the playoffs by them a couple of times there is a lot of pressure on the Cowboys I also think there's some pressure on the 49ers as well you know the 49ers want to maintain that undefeated record they want to maintain that bully mentality that they have but this is a a challenge that I, I think the Cowboys will be ready for and I'm really looking forward to it I'm looking forward yeah. to the preparation. I'm looking forward to after I get done with uh, with working with you today, sitting down and and watching the 49ers and trying to kind of figure out a way, the best way to attack or the best way to kind of plan and give our give our listeners the opportunity for uh, to to have uh, an understanding of you know maybe what lies ahead. I think we've been pretty consistent throughout our show. Which again, I thank everybody out there for listening the way you guys have. And, uh, you know, we just want to bring you the best possible coverage. And, I, and it's a really exciting week to do it. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really fun game. I, I'm, I'm, I love this. And like I said, we'll talk next segment a little bit about some of the history. But I just I think it's best for the NFL. Oh, there's some history. Two, there's some the, history. These two teams are good. Yeah, and there's history here. That, there's like, history goes back to, yeah, it goes back to the 70s. You can yeah. actually take this thing all the way back when I was a, when I was a kid. Yeah, behind me, all these pennants that you guys kind of laugh at me about. But th that's my history. That goes back to San Francisco in the in the in the nineteen seventies. So Which yeah, I, I I don't want to spoil that because we got a lot of fun stories there. Yeah, uh, real quick, I'm curious when you sit down and you're going to watch the tape of the the Forty ers Any interest in going back and watching the tape from the playoff game last year? Are you going to redo that one? I think uh, I I you know I I or burn it because the offensive coordinator. I, no, I, I I am interested in watching. I'm interested in watching because I always like to see how you matched up. How did mm -hmm. you match up uh, you know, with the Trent Williams? How did you handle Kyle Juszczyk? Uh What was the coverage like? You know, uh, you know, how were they trying to confuse uh, Brock Purdy in this game? Dallas had some success on defense. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, though, the ball just didn't bounce the way it usually bounces and, or you would hope that it bounces. And you know that's that's the things that you deal with. But yeah, I, I yeah, absolutely, I'll go back just to see what what the matchups looked like a little bit. Well, the Cowboys are going to be coming into this one uh, coming off of a big victory over the New England Patriots, largest halftime deficit in Bill Belichick's head coaching career, largest loss in Bill Belichick's head coaching career, uh, a dominant performance from the Cowboys all three phases. Um, I guess we, you know, as I often do, Brian. Uh, I guess I'll just toss it to you right off the bat, just with the question of what was the the blinking light for you, good or bad, when you went back and watched the tape of what was it, an absolutely dominant win for the Cowboys. I think the blinking light of good is that uh, Chuma Adoga continues to play at a level much higher than I even believed he could play at tackle, and to the point where. If we get into this week and there's continues to be questions about Tyron Smith, do I want Tyron Smith not to play in this game? That's I'm not saying that. I'd love to have Tyron Smith play in this game. I think it's important that Tyron Smith does play in this game, especially with the way that San Francisco's front generates pressure with four-man rush. 
which and, Jerry yeah. Jones told us on 105 through the yeah. fan this morning as we're recording this on Tuesday, he referred to Tyron Smith as iffy. Yeah. So that that sounds yeah. like it's it's going to be a, a tough It's going to be close. Here we go. So, yeah, but I, I think the blinking light good, Chuma Adoga. Uh, I was not one of those guys that was particularly excited about Chuma Adoga playing at any time. And I'm one of these guys, as you folks know, that if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I admit it. And uh, I'm happy to admit that, uh, that he's playing much better at a much better level than I thought he could even play from what I saw with my own eyes at training camp. They had a much better plan for him than I ever believed. I thought kicking Tyler Smith outside and maybe playing him at guard might be the way to go. I know there's people uh, that uh, listen to us that are wondering that exact same question. But, you know, when you talk to people in the organization, much like you do, Bobby, as an insider, they will tell you that they don't want to keep moving Tyler Smith around. And they felt like that maybe that Tyron Smith would be back. And that's something that Mike McCarthy said. You know, he why do you not play Tyler Smith outside? Because Tyron Smith is coming back. Well, it might be another week of Chuma Adoga this week, but blinking light good. Another blinking light that people see as bad is the red zone offense. I don't think it's as bad as people think it is. Okay. And, and I say that in a, this way. Um, I always encourage people if you can, and, it's, and I know it's a, a, an expensive proposition, but you do have the ability to go to NFL.com and get the All-22. You have that ability. And, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's pricey, but you get it and you learn about the game. You learn about when they get down in the red zone, what are the struggles you see? The struggles I see. Cover two, Dak tries to throw the ball to Schoonmaker up the middle of the seam. Schoonmaker doesn't make the play. But if Dak throws the ball to the outside of the wide open Brandon Cooks, it's a walk-in touchdown. You know, I, I see Schoonmaker run a route inside. I see Zach Martin, he, uh, Bentley, the linebacker, comes on a blitz. He... Zach Martin stones Bentley so bad at the line of scrimmage that Bentley stops his rush and jumps straight up in the air and ball's tipped. You know, Dak trying to fit the ball to Schoonmaker on the goal line. He's going to throw the ball to the to the outside of Schoonmaker, and it's going to be either be a tackle at the one or a walk-in touchdown. Mm -hmm. I see Dak Prescott hand the ball inside. They don't block it very clean on the uh, the read option. He doesn't pull the ball, but he's got him and Ferguson can walk in if he pulls the ball, which Ferguson turns around and slaps Dak in the chest like, why did you not pull it? You know, and you can see Dak kind of, you know, react like, oh, yeah. Brian, this, Brian, this sounds like you're trying to take down my quarterback. I'm not. <laughs> I, I think the quarterback I think the quarterback's done a really, really nice job. If you tell me uh, the quarterback has a 97 ra a rating uh, against Bill Belichick in three games of his career, probably the highest rating any quarterback's ever had against a Bill Belichick defense. And, well, you know, guess. yeah, you'd have to guess. Maybe Peyton Manning has got a, a rating. I don't know. Somebody's probably got a rating. But anyway, there, I, I see self inflicted stuff. I blinking light. Dallas needs to figure out in the red zone how many plays they are going to run where they try and fool the linebacker or the edge to chase the play. Because what they're having, the problems they're having is these edges or linebackers, again, if you get the all 22 from NFL.com, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting any money for this, but I'm just saying you can learn a lot about your football team watching. You really can yeah. And it's really simple to do. You don't have to be a former scout. You watch. You're like, wow, okay, here they're in the red zone. Let's see what's happening. Oh, Cooks is open here. Oh, wait a minute. Dak could have pulled the ball. Oh, wait a minute. Schoonmaker was open, but the ball got tipped. These are all things that happen during a game, and I feel like, I feel like they're correctable things. I don't see it being – but the, the one thing that I do worry about, Bobby, and I said it, I do worry about how many times are you going to try and fool a defensive end, an edge, or a linebacker to chase a ball? Because yeah. it seems like when they've tried to run that we're going to trick you type of play, those, those guys I've talked about have maintained leverage, stayed home, and then resulted into a negative play or a sack. 
Yeah, and, and I think that that's a, this is something that there's a lot of this that probably can be cleaned up by execution. Um, I, I think a lot of it also has to do with, there's probably a little bit of a fluky nature to this. I, yeah. I mean, look, if you, if you're one yard closer, you get a red zone conversion with CeeDee Lamb's touchdown. If, uh, like you said, if, if Cooks throws the ball to Cooks, but I mean, you don't even have to get to that. If it's just Schoonmaker finishes the catch, that's one that you convert there. You're, you're talking about your 60% in the red zone right there if you just have those two things happen. And so there, there's a little bit of flukiness to it. Uh, this is the question that Sean Sharif, our, our teammate at 105 Through the Fan, asked Mike McCarthy last Friday. I asked it right back to Sean on Monday. Uh, and, and I guess I'll throw it over to you, Brian. At what point, how, how many weeks in a row would we have to see some of the red zone struggles for you to say this is a trend and I can't just explain it away as bad luck anymore? If they were really bad, if they were not, if there were, if I didn't see creativity, and I mean creativity of trying to hide a guy and bring him emotion. Okay, creativity is trying to fool the edge. Or trying yeah. to fool the linebacker. That's creativity. You're trying to mess with somebody in order to get an advantage on the outside or get an advantage on the edge. If I didn't see I, I'm glad I'm seeing it, but I wonder at what point, what what at what cost. Is there another way to do that without leaving guys unblocked the option play against Arizona where they unblock two and CD lamb gets trapped for minus four, yeah. you know, I, the plays where they're kind of trying to mess with your eye level are not having success. The plays they are having success in is when you hand the ball to a Hunter Lipke and try and get three yards, four yards, you know, th those are, uh, or, you know, the play when you're trying to, if Dak would just pull the ball, you know, though, I think if I didn't see that, if I just saw them running the ball into a brick wall and then trying to throw fades all day and not complete any of those, now I think your trends are this is a bad red zone offense. Here's a big film takeaway for me uh, or for me from this particular game, Brian. Um, and I, 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 you've probably seen me talk about some of this on social media. I haven't, I haven't gotten your thoughts on it yet. So you may have a disagreement here, but – Here's what I'm thinking after watching two weeks of can Tyler I ask, Smith back in the lineup. Can I yeah. ask you something real quick? Yeah. Where, where do you think that – are you worried about the trends? I mean, you asked the question. Is yeah, there, I think I, I, there's definitely some execution aspect to this. Um, I do think that there's still uh, – Giants game. You get down there and, and you just throw three straight passes. Um, you get Pollard. You know, nice yardage, nice yardage. And then on third down, you try and get cute and Dak gets sacked. Like, I still think there is some aspect of this that is play calling. Um, but execution is part of it. And execution tends to level out and, and tends to even out over time. And so I, I don't think they're going to be 37% in the red zone all season like they are right now. Um, but I also don't know, based on what I've seen, if they'll be the 71% or whatever they were last year. I don't know that they'll be that. Um, and so it, it's just something that they'll have to work on, something that we'll see. They'll get a chance this week against the, the 49ers to see if that's different because that was something that they struggled with last year too um, in the red zone against 49ers in, in the game last year. So something to watch for sure. Brian, these two weeks against the Cardinals and this game against the Patriots, I think that if, if you tell me Tyler Smith is going to play the entire season like he's played these first two weeks, He's going to be an all-pro this year. He is a dominant football player these first two weeks he's been back. Can you elaborate on what you've seen? Yeah, this is a guy who I think the size, power, athleticism combination, whereas last year a lot of it what you'd see was stuff that was, you know, the, the traits would help him, but there were a lot of times where the technique would kill him. His technique – has gotten so much better. Subtle stuff with hand placement, um, you know, making sure blockers aren't getting to their ear or making sure edge rushers aren't able to get into what they want to do, swatting hands away. The the agility he plays with. There was a, a run for Pollard in the second quarter where Tyler 
helps on the uh, helps on the the nose there, and then he immediately yeah runs up and catches. I think it was Peppers. Yeah, caught Peppers. Had, had the had the athleticism to get back up, get Peppers, right. and just maul him out of the way. He plays with so much power. The technique is light years ahead of where it was last year, yeah. and this is massive, massive credit to Will McClay. Massive credit to Klein Kubiak, their national scout, who at the time was the the area scout when Tyler Smith was picked. And then I think you have to give credit to Joe Philbin for the initial work, um, but probably more Mike Solari for what he's done this offseason with him. And then a lot of credit for me uh, for Duke Manyweather. And then, of course, credit to Tyler Smith himself. But I think Will McClay, Klein Kubiak, the work they did, this personnel department did to know – these are correctable things and not only correctable things, but we've done the work to understand this is a kid who can take to the teaching and can take to the coaching. That's great work to me. Tyler Smith, the work he's put in, that's great. And then what Mike Solari is doing in, within the building and what Duke Manyweather is doing with him outside the building. I think this is a, a, a collective a plus for everybody involved because they have turned him into through his two games, one of the best offensive linemen in the NFL. No. And, um, and I think you you really covered the bases there, and I the the, the answer you gave was outstanding. I, I'll also add that coming out, this kid was one of the most penalized players in college football. Yeah, and that's something that he that tag he had to wear coming in. We don't talk about that anymore. We just mm-hmm. don't. And the thing that I was worried about, Bobby, was I think Joe Philbin had done a good job with these guys, and I was worried about Joe Philbin being gone now and. You know, were we going to see Steele take a step back? Were we going to see Smith take a step back? Were we going to see Biotish take a step back? Yeah. You know, and it's it hasn't been the case at all. Uh, you know, uh, great job by by Joe Philbin to get these guys ready to play uh, last year, especially Tyler Smith going from guard to tackle and playing the whole year the way he did. And the fact that he's now – you know, playing guard as well as he is, I think you're absolutely right. And I think you're absolutely right about all the credit you gave to the people that were there uh, and the, the ones that helped him start the journey that he's currently on. Yeah, it's it's just, it's a, like I said, it's a really great job by the Cowboys personnel department. This is, and I'll also say this, and I, I haven't gotten a chance to hear your thoughts on this particular player yet. Um, I, I know some people will look at the PFF grade and they'll see what they, they saw out there. I think Mozzie Smith played much better than what PFF and others are trying to give him credit for. I thought Mozzie Smith was was really good. And so I'll say this. When you want to fire off a hot take about Mozzie Smith, think about the hot takes you fired off about Tyler Smith 17 months ago. Yeah. And maybe just holster that for now and say, you know what? There's some steady progress here. And the Cowboys have shown very recently with Tyler Smith that when they get one of these raw toolsy projects that they're really good at identifying the guys that it's eventually going to click for because they know the mental makeup and the work ethic and the football character. That's what I would say about Mozzie Smith. But Brian, uh, really quickly, just some defensive thoughts before we transition over. Uh, like I said, I thought Mozzie Smith was much better in this game than he's been in others. Um, I thought he was getting off the ball a lot better. That's getting better every week. I only saw one time, Bobby, where where he got off slow. Other than yeah. that, he was playing with some – Good pad level and his ability to read the snap, react, get across the line, be active, not get blocked. I only saw one time where he really struggled with that. All the other snaps were he looked in unison with his teammates, the way they were coming off the ball. He's doing a much better job of of having a comfort factor of doing that. I think that's really, really helped him. Yeah, absolutely. And he's a guy who is really putting in the work. Uh, you know, they, they, the D-line all goes out there and works out with Adam Dirty before the game. Mozzie Smith spent probably 10 to 15 minutes longer than everyone else working with Adam Dirty um, after warm-ups. And so that's a guy who's committed to getting better. He's always asking questions of, of the other defensive linemen. Just I, I, I think that that's trending the right direction. I thought this was the best game the linebackers have played there this you year go. by far. Yeah. That was a big difference in this game. Van Der Esch was good. Clark was good. Yeah. Um, that That's a, a trending up, encouraging aspect for me. And then, of course, the, the headline was Deron Bland. There you go. Who you, you, you got you, fantastic. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. Those were the two extra thoughts I was going to give. Linebacker room, much better job this week of handling the downhill plays. 
uh, getting to the football, finishing the way they did, and then Deron Bland. Um, we all really believe that, yes, the Diggs injury was was a, a painful one, but Deron Bland and even Jordan Lewis ramping up a little bit, playing in the slot, I think has been a good combination. It'll be a huge challenge for those defensive backs this week. Yeah, absolutely. And and like like I said, we gave the – when you talk about the credit that they the Cowboys get for Tyler Smith, they also need a lot of credit for uh, Deron Bland, who, I mean, eight picks in, in 20 games or whatever he's played here. Again, that's a great job by Will McClay. That's a great job by Ross Winchie, the area scout yeah. out there on the West Coast. Um, Done a nice job and, with that. And a great job by the coaching staff for communicating, guys like Dan Quinn and Joe Witt, communicating the attributes they want, working closely with the co- the scouting staff to make sure you pair the attributes with the the talent that you're out there. It's one of those things that the coaching staff and the scouting staff, I think you're seeing on the field this year, the harmony that they're in is producing results with some of these young players. So that's a big benefit. Continuity is big. Yes. Teams teams that don't have coaching and scouting continuity are, are will struggle because their roster will be uh, mismatched in a lot of ways. There'll be yep. little guys, big guys, and it won't fit to how the, the coach probably wants to, to operate. Absolutely. You are listening to the Love of the Star podcast. The Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian. Uh, San Francisco 49ers come to town this week. Hmm. At, or, or not come to town. They're they're matching up against them. The Cowboys are going to Santa Clara to take Good old Levi's Stadium, yeah. Yeah, Levi. It's it's not Candlestick anymore, even though we did have a, uh, a caller call in on Sean and RJ this week on the fan and said, I think those boys are going to take it to him in Candlestick this week. And it's like, well, it's not been Candlestick for, for a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, I totally – I miss Candlestick. I miss Candlestick Park. Candle, candlestick was – there's Below there's sea level, there. swampy, that, that, that side of the field where you can't really – it went like into the baseball outfield and the yeah. stands where you probably couldn't see very well over there. I, I will say this um, as we get into this thought. Man, in Green Bay, we had such good success against San Francisco. And they had some really good teams. You know, yeah. they, they had some really – Mike Holmgren and a lot of those guys that we had that were San Francisco guys. Uh, man, they, that was a big, big week. But growing up a Cowboy fan uh, in the 70s – matter of fact, my uncle uh, played 18 years for the 49ers, uh, Charlie Kruger. Really? Yeah, he was a defensive tackle. Matter of fact, is in their Hall of Fame and all that. It played 18 years for the 49ers, played in the in the, in the 60s and 70s uh, with the Niners. And so he goes all the way back to Kizar Stadium. So I remember, like, Kizar, first playoff game, and then I remember Candlestick, and I remember being in a, a divisional game where Alvin Harper caught the ball. Oh, the, and yeah. 80, yeah, and so a lot of great – Memories. I, I was talking with Nate Newton this this morning. Matter of fact, he and I was doing some work out with the Cowboys at the Star on the break, and Nate and I were just talking about the games against the 49ers and just you know the legendary matchups that those guys had. So it's it's a great history. Like I say, it goes all the way back to the 70s with John Brody and Gene Washington and my uncle Charlie Kruger and Dave Wilcox and you know I mean they they had a. Forest Blue. I mean, they they had <laughs> Ray Wershing. I'm just naming guys. Ray I mean, they, Wershing. Look at Ray that. Wershing was a kicker for the 49ers. Yeah, I remember back in the back in the day. So yeah, Ted Qualick. I, I I just that that I can't tell you what I had for breakfast today, but I could tell you about the Oakland A's, the 70s Oakland A's, and I could tell you about the 70s San Francisco 49ers. How about that? Damn right. That that's what it's about. Now this is a like we said this history here. Uh, Brian, it's as even as it can be. Uh, the history of the Cowboys and the 49ers. It was like 16, 16 and 1. 19, 19 and 1. There we go. Uh, 19, we know. 19 yeah, and 1. Yeah. Uh, six NFC championship games that these teams have played against each other. Um, Crazy. I believe outside of the the Rams might have the edge by a little bit in terms of most playoff games against the Cowboys. It's the Rams or the 49ers. Um, yeah. But this is for there me. There's some and great Rams just, games too. Yeah, oh my gosh. Those, old Rams those, teams. Those yeah. 70s games were great. They um, were great. And, and by the way, before anybody says you weren't alive in the 70s, I know I wasn't alive. YouTube I mean, was. I'm an avid collector of original <laughs> broadcasts. I've got yeah. all those games on yeah. DVD. Here YouTube. Go back and watch them. Yeah. yeah. So, Brian, this is um, 
for me, the NFL, and I, I mentioned it earlier, the NFL is, is, is at its best when the Cowboys and the 49ers are really good. Yeah. Um, to me, it's like it's similar uh, with when you get the Lakers and the Celtics and and that rivalry is really hot and both teams are really good. That's great for the NBA. When the Yankees and the Red Sox are really good and they're, they're going at each other, that's great for Major League Baseball. Those are the things that you want to see. The Cowboys and the 49ers, to me, are, are right there. And when you just think over the history, I was, you know, getting ready, sending out the call for questions. Hmm. And I was just, like, grabbing some Cowboys 49ers photos to look through. And when you think over the years, man, there there's these most two most recent playoff games, which in the grand scheme of history won't be remembered as pivotal moments in all likelihood. Um, but just contributing to the history here, you've got the Terrell Owens – Going to the center of the star, uh, George Teague hit. That was massive. 92, 93, 94, those NFC title games. Wow. Just giants. Two yeah. dominant football teams. And it, it used to be the joke uh, on broadcasts back then that that was the Super Bowl. The NFC championship game in 92, 93, 94, that was the Super Bowl because Buffalo and, and the Chargers weren't going to beat San Francisco and Dallas. And the, the way that each team kept trying to to level up on them. 94, the, the 49ers were tired of losing. Yeah. Um, and and they, they, they hit a point that, and it's a different level, obviously, in terms of the intensity, but they hit a point that Dallas kind of feels like they're at right now, where they're just, they're trying to do things to to make sure they get ahead. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's very much an arms race there in the 90s. And they go out there and they they get Ricky Jackson and Dion yeah. and and they get Ken Norton and uh you know they they really went all in to try and make things as difficult as possible. But those four those three NFC title games right there were impressive. I, I want to stop on that for a second because I'm curious as a guy who was in Green Bay at the time. <laughs> yeah, I I know you've talked before about Eric Williams and and how intimidating he was and how much trouble he was for Reggie White. Yeah. Uh, my favorite rivalry, uh, as a, a as a viewer of the '90s Cowboys, my favorite rivalry in the world was Kevin Smith against Jerry Rice, mm. because Pop Pop hated Jerry Rice. He did, and and Jerry Rice hated Kevin Smith. Yeah, um, and it was you know you know what it reminded me of a little bit in terms of if you want to go back, it's it's an Odell Beckham Josh Norman just yeah don't like each other uh, ninety. 93 they get in a fight in the tunnel mm -hmm. uh kevin smith and jerry rice do that starts a brawl in the tunnel essentially um 94 the the 49ers get up big in that game it's 21 7 near the end of the first quarter and kevin smith every single play is just getting in jerry rice's face and gets mm -hmm. jerry rice a little bit out of the game sure uh, it takes him out of it a little bit and so it's it's fascinating that back and forth what was the what was the perspective for you guys in Green Bay back then of a guy like Kevin Smith? Like oh, I, I know you guys didn't have to say, it, but but yeah. what, did you, what did you think of Kevin Smith as a player back? Okay, then? first off, like I said, we played really well against the 49ers. I mean, the one year we go out to San Francisco and just Steve Young and we just maul him. I mean, and. Dallas is probably sitting at home like, thank God we get to play the Packers. Now, we loved playing Steve Young and at the time Elvis Gerbach played in the game. I mean, there was always a matchup that we were dealing with then. And we were fine with it. We, we could play at Candlestick. We could play at Lambeau. It didn't matter. We could not beat Kevin Smith. And, and, I, and I mentioned it, the whole thing with, you know, with Reggie White sitting, we were, matter of fact, we're sitting at Candlestick. We won a game, win the divisional game, and we're on the way to the championship game. And everybody's kind of celebrating, and Reggie's just sitting there. And I go, Rev, what's, what's up? And he just looked at me and he goes, Eric Williams. And he knew, he knew. And, but that's what those matchups in the 90s were those matchups that you dealt with the Giants, the Cowboys the 49ers, the Packers. I mean, they were all – everybody was just – you know, it was it was tough. It was just yeah. a tough – it was a tough league. and it, But you knew that in the – we'd play these regular season games and you find a way to win them, and it's kind of like you had it one up on 
the team as you got to the playoffs. And it usually yeah. meant you were either going to have home field or you were going to have to go on the road, whether you won or lost those games. You know, you might have three, four losses during the year, three losses, and one of them was to the Cowboys or the 49ers or, you know, that's how yeah. much those games meant. And playing the, the rosters, you know, playing against the Cowboys back then, that, that was no bargain for us in Green Bay. We, we didn't have that kind of talent. But what we had was we had enough talent to beat San Francisco because we had the idea of how to play 49er football. Mm-hmm. You know, with Mike Holmgren and the, the guys we had on staff, Andy Reid, John Gruden, you know, those, those, those were young guys. But Mike, they had learned the Bill Walsh way. And, and that's, that's the great thing about playing the 49ers was that if you, it, it's like you beat the 49ers, you're beating history. Not, not maybe yeah. the history, not maybe the history that you beat with New England, but to beat Bill Belichick, I was asked today by Derek Eagleton the best win so far this season of the, of the ones they've had. It's by far the New England game. You know, I mean, yeah. it might take it might take a uh, uh, Bill Belichick eighteen years now to pass Don Shuley. He's got eighteen more victories he needs, but to win games like that, to win games against historical teams. That's why this game, I mean, that's why this game means a lot to San Francisco. Dallas has a tremendous history in the National Football League. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the great things about growing up a fan. I mean, I went 20 years without seeing a losing season. I always expected to be in the playoffs. Always expected to play the 49ers. And then I went to and then I went to Green Bay and I became part of that. You know, you become yeah. part of that and and it, and it's tough. The, Dallas Dallas in my opinion People will say, well, you know, the Brad Shams and others, and, and I respect everybody that, you know, has an opinion on this. I really do. I, I really do feel like this game is more than just a game this week. I just, yeah. it's, it's, it's more than that. It's that, it's a, it's a psychological barrier that you're dealing with right now. Here, here's a question for you. And I said this this morning on 105 Through the Fan, again, as we record this on Tuesday. I feel uh, winning is the, the, the is the objective. Uh, yeah. As Jerry said in his opening press conference when he bought the team, uh, we must win, we will win, win is the name of the game. That, right. That's what it's about. But I I feel like this particular game This particular is about, game is about not losing. Yeah. I, I, I don't yeah. know I don't know what it will do to the psyche and morale of this team if they get beat by San Francisco again. And so I think this is a yeah. I think this is a huge mental mental hurdle for them. Not not that they can't overcome, but it's it's just it's it's a daunting thing where when they win, this could be a huge boost. Brian, I don't know about you. Would this be the biggest regular season win since what Seattle in 2014? That's I I go back to the Seattle game because Seattle was coming off a Super Bowl win and all, and there was that mystique about playing in Seattle. The Legion of Twelfth Man, the Twelfth Man, the Legion of Boom, all that stuff. There was all this mystique about having to go and win a game there. And Dallas went there, and Zach Martin and that crew, uh, Tyron Smith, they hammered Seattle in the running game. I mean, they, DeMarco Murray, every every ball, every pass, Romo protection, and man, it, it's one of those games where. You were fighting for inches, but you just, you knew as Dallas was just, they just completely beat Seattle up. And and Dallas didn't get the chance to go back in 14. That was the the Dez game in Green Bay. But standing on that sideline and then walking off and then getting on the bus, I'm thinking, and I I remember telling Nick Eatman this on the bus. I said, if Dallas would have won this game, we'd be going to the Super Bowl. Because I knew in my heart that Dallas was going to go to Seattle and hammer them again, and Seattle was glad they didn't have to play Dallas. Yeah. You know, I I I think this is so important for Dallas because there's a likelihood that these teams could match up again at the end of the year. And now, what do we we do? We go back and we look. Well, what's happened the previous three times? You know, Dallas's defense has played really well. Well, Dallas's offense hasn't played particularly well. Dak Prescott, this has happened. You know, you go out there and you lose this game and you look bad doing it. You know, losing the game will be bad. 
but you look bad doing this, you create doubt. You yep. create doubt. And the worst thing that athletes, a lot of athletes will say, oh, no, no, we have faith. We have, no, there's, there's, there's doubt. You know, I'll tell you this, when the Metrodome in Minneapolis was open. Yeah. And you said my team had to go play at the Metrodome. I doubted we were going to win. 0-12, never won a game at the Metrodome. Never won a game at the House Metrodome. Of yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Look at what Arizona. Look now at Arizona in that situation. Next time yeah. you play Arizona. Well, you know, look what happens. You, you know, you, there's a team that, you know, you go and play in Arizona. It's like, man, what, what's going to happen badly? Dallas has to turn this around. They have to turn the narrative around that it's not the same old Cowboys going to Levi and playing this football game. There's a couple quotes I want to read really quickly before we go to the mailbag, Brian. Um, this was a, a quote from Jonathan Hankins on his conference call, which Hankins got here last year. He wasn't even here for the the first playoff game. But he's, he's a leader, and I think he knows guys like Curse and things like that, how much it means to them. By the way, that is my uh, – jumping back to Kevin Smith really quickly. I said it earlier this week, but – to me, that's who J. Ron Curse, I think, reminds me of. Not not as a player, but as a personality type, as I think he reminds me of Kevin Smith. Yeah. Um, but Jonathan Hankins said, it's always a battle uh, when we're going against the Niners, and obviously the last two years they've had our numbers, so this game means a lot, more than uh, just a regular season game. Two of the best teams yeah. in our conference, so we've got to turn the page and beat the 49ers, man. It sucks to continue to lose to these Yeah, guys. he's not wrong. And that's the way they feel. And yeah. Mike McCarthy's quote yesterday, you live to play in these kinds of games. You dream about these kinds of games. You don't want to make it bigger than it is, but the reality is it's not just another game. It's not another and, game. And it's, it's not, just and not. I think that it's, it's disingenuous if Mike McCarthy was trying to tell his team this week, like, guys, head down, same thing. Yeah. Those players know it's not. And Mike it's McCarthy is not. not. Credit it's Mike not. McCarthy for, for being direct, too. It, you're absolutely right, Bobby. I mean, I, I, and I appreciate Mike for saying that. This is not another game. You lose this game, I mean, you have to live with it. The Cowboys have proven one thing, though. When they lose a game, they tend to come back and, and, and play. It's one of their best games, so that probably doesn't bode well for the Chargers on a Monday night. But if they win this game, now you've, 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 you've taken a big step. You've taken a big step to win. If these two teams meet again, then it's like Dallas has the confidence that, hey, we can go to Levi – and win a football game in a tough condition on you know it's not going to get any bigger than this in my opinion unless it's a playoff game because yeah. it's a Sunday night the whole world will be watching you know you you are either going to find a way to get this done or you're going to lose this game you're going to be 3 and 2 and you're going to have a lot of questions about you ever beating this football team at some point you have to stand up to the bully and you have to take the bully out and this is the opportunity to do it. You will, you will, in all likelihood, if you want to finish this season with a Super Bowl trophy, you are likely going to have to play the 49ers in January absolutely. at some point. Yeah, and absolutely. And so, man, I just think for just laying the foundation for that game that, that may be coming your way in January, I don't think you want to have three losses in no, 18 months. No, absolutely no, you, absolutely that, not. That'd be a lot for that. That'd be a major disadvantage for that team heading into that game. Yeah. You're listening to the Love of the Star podcast. The Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, it is now time for our Dean Julia Love of the Star mailbag. Always love hearing from you guys. We'll return things over to you. Get your thoughts, get your questions. Uh, first question here from Terrence Watson. Uh, and, and we'll deep dive into the 49ers tape a little bit more. But, Brian, who in your mind outside of Christian McCaffrey is the biggest threat to the Cowboys in this game? Uh, he says Debo Samuel or Brandon Ayuk. Or maybe if you have somebody else, uh, a threat. Brock Purdy's playing pretty well right now. But Ayuk Man. specifically has been putting up some big numbers. Yeah, Ayuk has been good. How about George Kittle? Do you have somebody? Kittle, Kittle can hurt you in yeah. blocking, yeah. catch it. Like he, he is a handful. Yeah, Kyle Uzcheck is another guy that can hurt you with the blocking part of the game and running the ball. You know, I uh, uh, McCaffrey is huge. The quarterback has been outstanding. I think you could find ways to rattle him a little bit, and uh, that's that would be my hope. I might go back and watch and see what Philadelphia did to these guys before. Um, before um, Purdy got hurt, before hurt, Purdy got hurt, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's just uh, I, I I don't know if you have a real a real answer for George Kittle. 
You know, we saw we saw the uh, Patriots tight ends make a couple of plays. It wasn't very anything extensive, but do you have somebody that can match up with George Kittle? That's the issue. George Kittle is a good blocker too. So what will happen is he will he'll block, he'll block, and then the next thing you know, he'll fake a block, and then he'll go out on a route, and then now you're not covering him. So I, but Brandon Ayuk is Brandon Ayuk in college was a hell of a player. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And then and and, then, when, and, and and dealing again. Sorry, Bobby, dealing with no, Debo good. Samuel in the backfield. We saw what happened with Rondell Moore. You know, if you don't deal with the you don't deal with the running the 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 wide receiver running back guy, and you don't deal with that very well, there could be problems there. Cowboys have done a good job. I was just having to look this up. I was curious. They've done a good job against Kittle uh, a couple different times. He was held uh, to one catch yeah. for 13 yards in one game. The uh, first playoff game in 21, one catch, 18 yards. Last year he got you a little bit. Five yeah. catches, 95 yards. Yeah, I, I'm, he had the know, long he had the long catch off the scramble play. That I, was I, a problem. I, I'm gonna. I I, I want to. I definitely want to ask Jay Ronkers about that this week. Yeah. Um, in the locker room, just like hey, I, Kittle, how much are specifically? We know you want to get the 49ers, but specifically, how excited are you to get a chance to to redeem y'all yourself against Kittle? I worry about Trent Williams too. The offensive Trent tackle. Williams is is a mauler. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and look, they've, they've got a lot of good players defensively. Like, I mean, yeah. this is a, this is going to be a t- – honestly, the person that probably – you know what my answer is? Fred Warner. Be the most on offense is Kyle Shanahan. Well, yeah. That's I mean, Shanahan about. the way – because, like I say, Kyle Shanahan – I didn't see New England really do anything to steal from Arizona the way they're – you know, the way to move the ball. Yeah. Kyle Shanahan, to me, is going to look at the Arizona tape and say, oh, look, we can pin and pull. Oh look, we can move offensive linemen. Oh look, we can put running uh, wide receivers in the backfield. Oh look, we can do bunch formation and and scatter from here. Oh look, we can throw the ball to the tight end. You know, oh look, they'll lose a guy if you put bunch formation and try. You know, by the way, yeah. two two weeks in a row, the Cowboys have lost a receiver in route. You know, and you look at but with Wilson in Arizona, and then last, uh, you know, with your kid, uh, you know, the the rookie wide receiver from New England. Demario, yeah, uh, Demario, the, the, the Demario Douglas, Douglas, the, yeah, had, had that spin move, which was just absolute. yeah. I mean, six, I, 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 sixty-nine I, yard I, chunk play and a forty-two yard chunk play. The last two weeks, losing a wide receiver. You don't think I that Kyle Shanahan's going to figure out a way to get one of his li- wide receivers lost in coverage? The, Doug, the Douglas play because that was on the first drive when the uh-huh. game was still a question. Uh-huh. When I saw that, all I could think about was. We told you guys about Demario Douglas. That, yeah. that was that was one of the guys to worry about here. Yep. Uh, next question here from De La Cruz, Brian. What parallels do you see between this Cowboys team and the 1994 49ers team, who were coming off <laughs> two playoff losses to Dallas, ultimately to win it all and exact the revenge? So I will say really quickly. First off, those two Cowboys, the the Cowboys teams that have beaten the 49ers, went on to win the Super Bowl. These 49ers teams have not won the Super Bowl, yeah. and and this Dallas team is not as good as that 94 Niners team, but. If you're looking for like a a a, a sort of some parallel, here, here's mm-hmm. my thoughts on the parallel. 92 was a game that I think I've, Carmen Policy has talked about this before. I've heard some other people reference it. Most people felt like Dallas arrived about a year early. Yes, and, and, and that they that they they were not a better team than San Francisco. They were better that day. Yes, uh, and so because of that. I think the first playoff loss for Dallas versus 49ers, people felt like Dallas was better than San Francisco that year. They were at home. They got upset, and it was a bad matchup. Last year, San Francisco was better than you, Mm -hmm. and and you were going on the road. 93, Dallas was better than San Francisco, and San Francisco had to go on the road. And Dallas went out and loaded up. They acquired veteran players, Brandon Cook, Stephon Gilmore. It's not Deion Sanders and Ricky Jackson or or Ken Norton, but they went out and and added guys. So – for me, I think that they're trying to respond in smaller but similar ways, uh, and, and they're trying to – they're definitely trying to catch them uh, the same way that the 49ers were trying to catch Dallas. I think you perfectly nailed it. Absolutely See, look, right. Look at that. I, look I, at I, you, I, football I, man. Yeah, I, I could do this whole thing, Brian. That, that's, that's what it is. Uh, all right, next question here from Dean Julia. Can this be the week we see a Brandon Cook steep shot? I will say this. Brian, and I think you've I think you've confirmed this before. If Jerry Jones is 
talking about something in his interviews schematically. Yeah. That's that's something he's hearing in his meetings. And, right. and 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 it's top of mind. He is bringing up Brandon Cooks and wanting to see him more involved. So I think this has been coming up in staff meetings of we need to make sure we're we're getting the ball down the field to Brandon Cooks a little more. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think the the thing that we Brandon Cooks has run some routes. If you're one of those guys or gals that really likes analytics and numbers and stuff like that, Brandon Cooks has been running routes that are actually been deeper. And so it's just a matter of, you know, Brandon Cooks, I, I, I know for a fact when you went back, and I, I think you saw this too, when you watched the All-22, uh, Brandon Cooks was open on the Luke Schoonmaker drop, yeah. you know, in the end zone. He was open. I mean, he had separation you know, on the outside. And the the thing is, I think with Brandon Cooks is that he is he is running routes that are further down the field. Uh, you know, that, you know, when you watch him the way that he's, you know, in in these games, and I was just kind of going through I was just going through the the charts and stuff like that with him, you know, this this year. And yeah. and there there are routes where he he's taken it you know twenty plus there's a there's some stuff that he's done you know in that fifteen to twenty range that he's you know the success that he's had uh, has been kind of in between that really between the you know five to fifteen that's yeah. where but but there have been routes there have been routes where he is. Where he's run them further down the field, they just haven't, you know, they just haven't materialized like we we thought that they might. We thought that there was going to be a lot of, you know, deep shots and stuff like that. But, you know, he's 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 run thirty yard routes. He's won, run twenty yard routes, you know, that, that have been you know incomplete. Uh, yeah. That the twenty yard route that he had it was you know, an incomplete pass, but. You know, yeah, getting him going, I think is 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 really key. And how you get him going, uh, you know, with the that that ability, like I said, the ability to uh, take advantage of his speed. You know, like I said, he's he's had he's had routes, you know, a couple of different times. Just if I can't believe in analytics and things like that, where he's running it for over 30, 30 like thirty five yards a route. He had a 31 yard route. He's had several routes that have been run at, at at the 20 yard. A lot of things kind of underneath. His catches really have all been kind of underneath, but there are routes that have gone to the 20 and then and then beyond. But they need to hit on some of those routes. Absolutely, and I think that's what Jerry's emphasis is about. That means that's coming up in, the, in these meetings. And look, they've wanted to do it. Like, like I mean, we pointed it out after the Arizona game. The start of the second drive, they did a play action boot. And they wanted to hit Cooks. The safety just happened to roll over. They've lo- they've tried to hit it um, because it's it's a waste of resources if you don't use him in that fashion. And so that that's where that comes down to. That does it for us here today on the Love of the Star podcast. We will be back with you guys again later this week uh, with analysis of the Cowboys and 49ers. Um, take a look at the 49ers tape, Brian. Even if you don't, I will I will suffer through it. I'll, I'll go back. I'll watch Cowboys 49ers game. Um, I can't wait to see how Zeke snapped the ball again. Uh, and, and just it was a good really, snap, just poor yeah, block, right? I I, I I can't wait to grade him uh, on, on that snap and everything else. But I think that I, was a, a good snap for a plus minus on the block, I think. Is yeah, what you would say. yeah, yeah. That was a it's, plus it's minus a, plus minus situation. It's, yeah. a, it's a big game this week. Huge. Uh, it's actually huge. I'm incredibly excited yeah. to get into yeah. the locker room, talk to these guys and uh, get a chance to uh, go out to Santa Clara and, and you know, see the game and, and, and get an idea of where the Cowboys stand exactly. For Brian Broaddus, I'm Bobby Belt. We'll talk to you guys again next time. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next one.